Hi, this is Metric, and I'm here at my home studio in London, and uh, I'm going to be talking about my uh, latest single, Hackers, uh, the creative process behind it, um, as well as the production techniques, some of the mixing techniques. Um, I'm going to be talking about sort of synthesizing drums and how I go about getting my drum sound, um, and yeah, some hopefully some useful bits along the way. So, hope you enjoy the video. Okay, um, so. I'm going to talk a little bit, a bit about the creative process of how this track came together and um, it started off um, with a concept and the concept was to create a track that was incredibly simple based around uh, one riff and one riff only so essentially the riff is uh, the bass line and the main hook um, so in order for that to work, I needed to create a sound that uh, was big enough to fill up the frequency spectrum. Um, and uh, yeah, so that started off with uh, this riff. And uh, the actual sound itself, I think this may even be an older version of the riff, but it'll give you an idea. Uh, so yeah, so that sound um, it's, it's quite interesting because um, it, th there's, there's different articulations of it depending on uh, where they were played um, uh, or which octave they were uh, played on. Um, so I created um, an instrument rack and um, I essentially had, um, uh, I separated the instrument rack so uh, by key. So so essentially in Ableton what you can do is when you, when you create an instrument rack is you can assign uh, ranges um, of, of MIDI notes uh, to groups of instruments. So what I did here was I took the first sort of in, in the lower registers, um, I've got the sub here and then uh, the mid bass patch which I made in Serum which kind of is, is the more kind of staccato um, sound. And that, that was essentially um, a, a sawtooth um, with uh, 16 voices laid up in unison, detuned, um, with a pretty harsh resonant filter on the attack, uh, which is controlled by this LFO here. So it kind of has that plucked, kind of grungy sound to it. Um, that is then underpinned by the sub, which is sitting underneath it there. And that's very simply uh, a sine wave, again, in Serum. Um, and just to talk a little bit about subs as well, because um, if you use just a pure uh, sine wave, then you're essentially only getting the fundamental of, of the wave. Um, and this can be fine in some cases, but uh, a lot of the time, you know, you kind of want your sub to fill out a bit more of the low end, um, not only because it, it, it can sound bigger, but also it will translate better onto systems which aren't capable of reproducing that sub, for example, iPhones or laptop speakers. So in order to give, give the bass a little bit more presence, um, I'll often open up the wavetable editor, and here you can actually control the fundamental and the harmonics of a sound. So here I've added a bit of the, the first harmonic here. Obviously you can add more in, and you, kind of, you can give the sound a little bit more body and tone, so you can hear the sound changing, more harmonics going up the frequency spectrum. But yeah, in this case I just used the first harmonic laid with the fundamental, so that fills it out nicely, uh, and then obviously combines with sound. And then, um, so the riff itself, it kind of goes up into the, uh, the next octave, so I wanted to have a slightly different articulation of that sound. Uh, so to go into a bit more depth about that. So on this version of the sound, you can hear that the cutoff is a lot more open. So it's essentially the same sound as the more staccato version, um, except that there's a, a far less kind of harsh um, sort of attack on the uh, filter cutoff. So when you play these together, you hear the whole riff together. And you can kind of see the MIDI notes moving up there based on the assignment. 
Um, and yeah, just to kind of go into a bit more detail about how I came up with the riff, um, I actually used this kind of comically looking but very, very useful uh, MIDI guitar. I'll show you, there you go. Um, I mean, it kind of looks like a toy uh, on first glance, but uh, it's actually very powerful because it, it's, it works as a, uh, a MIDI instrument as well. And uh, what I did with this, so I, I kind of created the patch, and then I, I guess because guitar is, is the instrument I'm most comfortable with, uh, it was a lot easier to, uh, I often find it a lot easier to come up with riffs and stuff. And uh, yeah, so I literally just kind of jammed away. It was like, so that's the kind of vibe. And then obviously recorded in the MIDI. Um, and then, uh, so obviously there's like a lot of processing on that sound to kind of make it full and uh, to try and help it fill up as much of the frequency spectrum as possible. Um, so often what I'll do with uh, those kinds of sounds, because you, you know, I'll, be, I'll be adding like a lot of um, you know, like distortion and saturation, um, I think within the patch itself, there's like a lot of distortion, there's a dimension expander, and uh, sort of using the built-in multiband compressor in, um, in Serum. So it often sort of extends the release of sounds uh, quite dramatically. So you're getting lots of kind of tails and kind of unwanted um, sort of noise uh, in sound. So what I'll usually do is I'll, I'll, I'll get the sound kind of, you know, as overdriven as, as, as I need it to be. Um, and then I'll bounce it as audio. Um, to, so then you'll have a lot more control over, you know, like the tails of the sounds and making sure they don't bleed into each other. Um, so in this case, what I did was I separated um, like the staccato notes, so you can hear there, and obviously the high ones on the octave. Um, essentially, what I did once I'd, I'd bounced out the audio was was kind of auditioned. Um, you know, which, which of these bass notes sounded the best. Um, and also kind of checked things like phase and made sure that, you know, they, they had have, have the strongest amplitude. Um, so once I'd kind of taken the strongest notes, and what I did here was just like, like repeated quite a few of them, so it kind of gives it quite like a almost synthetic robotic edge, you know, rather than just letting the riff play up by itself and, you know, each kind of instance of the note will have a slightly different character because the oscillators are starting at different points. So this way you can get, you know, the, the sort of optimum levels of amp amplitude per note. Um, and yeah, so that's, that's kind of one of the advantages of, 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 you know, bouncing it down to audio. And, you know, with, with each instance, you know, I, I've kind of EQ'd them differently. Um, and, yeah, so, so when they all come together, you know, you're going to get a much cleaner sound. Um, okay, so uh, once I had the, uh, the sort of main riff uh, bounced down to audio and separated, kind of e and EQ'd in its different, uh, in it, you know, its different states, um, I then grouped those tracks together and did a bit of further processing. Um, so, I, I mean, one of the kind of obvious things you would need to do with a sound like this is to... Uh, kind of monoize uh, the lower frequencies and Ableton's utility plugin actually does that really quickly. Um, as you can see here, we've got um, the, the base mono switch here, which will essentially put everything depending on what you choose here. And in this case, below 500 Hertz into mono. So that kind of reduces any, or sort of eliminates any phase issues you might have with those lower um, harmonics. Um, I then uh, use this EQ here, which is great. This is a, a soft tube. I think it comes with the um, Native Instruments Complete. Um, but it's really good for like adding kind of top air, you know, really high frequency stuff. Um, and here I kind of gave it a boost at 12K, like a high shelf, which um, if I actually turn off these effects, you'll be able to hear what I'm doing a bit better. Um, so before, and using that kind of, just kind of lifted those tops a little bit more. Um, and then next uh, I had uh, a mid-side EQ um, and I'll go into a little bit more detail about the uh, mid-side processing a bit later because that was quite a, a large part of the, uh, the mix down process. Um, so uh, just to keep it brief, in, the, in this case I just used Ableton's EQ8, put it in side mode and just rolled off some of the tops and the high mids 
because uh, I wanted a bit more emphasis on, on the lower mids when it came to the stereo content of this sound. Um, and then essentially what I had after that, yeah, so just a simple roll off on the lows. Um, the API 550A, which is a, a great sort of EQ by Waves, which had kind of a, a, had more of a colorization EQ. Um, so I, I, I quite like to add, add in quite a lot of stuff with, with this EQ. Um, so yeah, that's really just giving it a bit more presence. Um, so I've boosted up here around 12.5 kilohertz, again at 3 kilohertz and, and at 400, because uh, I felt that the sound was perhaps lacking a bit of that. Um, and then next up, um, I've got an LFO tool, and, and this is actually, again, part of, part of the mixing process, but um, you know, uh, I find it a really good way, um, instead of you know, traditionally using sidechain compression to duck against the uh, kick and the snare, um, I actually prefer to do it in LFO tool, or at least at the time of making this track. And um, what this gives you the ability to do is to, you know, you, you can actually put in your own curves to, uh, and, and tell the sound how, you know, how you want it to dynamically change when the, the kick and the snare hit. So you don't always, you, you might not necessarily want the same amount of um, volume reduction on the kick as you do the snare. And similarly um, on the second kick in the sequence, because, you know, for example, if I play this to you without LFO tool, So you're hearing the riff with, with no ducking at all. And then if I switch it on. So, you know, you can really hear how it's, it's ducking on the kick and it's ducking slightly less on the snare. And then again, when the next kick plays, um, we're doing slightly less ducking because I find that, you know, for example, if this was a sidechain compressor, you'd have something essentially like this. So both each time the kick drum plays, you're getting quite a dramatic ducking on the sound, uh, and that and that can actually it, it can it can actually ruin the sort of groove of, of the riff. Like in this case, if I, if I play it with the drums, see that doesn't sound quite right because it's ducking too much on the second kick. So, you know, here I would actually just make that curve less extreme. Um, so yeah, that that basically is a really good way of resolving uh, that. That issue, um, and you know you, you're getting really clean cuts then. Um, but the one thing you, you really need to be uh, aware of when, because uh, LFO tool is is a MIDI synced effect, so it essentially uses your host's clock in order to accurately um, reproduce uh, whatever it is you're telling it to do. So, in in the case of Ableton, um, it's actually subject to um, to uh, delay um, like latency essentially. So if you put anything uh, prior to it in the chain that introduces latency, then this plugin will either be, well, it will essentially not, not be in sync and it won't be perfectly compensated for. Um, so if I just give you an example of that, uh, make it kind of a, a bit more extreme to demonstrate the effect. If I put like an ozone maximizer here, um, and because this is, it's a limiter. It's going to be introducing quite a lot of latency. And if, if you hover over the plugin in Ableton, you can actually see how much latency that is creating. So in this case, it's 721 samples. So that's introducing a latency of that value. Um, now, if I then play the sound, you hear how the ducking is now out of time. And um, uh, you know, that, that could actually, you know, uh, that's quite a crucial thing when, when you're doing your mixes because, you know, you, you want your transients to be clean, you want everything to be synced up and perfect. Um, Ableton does an amazing job of that, uh, otherwise with its plug-in delay compensation if you're using kind of audio-based effects such as compressors. And, but as soon as you introduce a MIDI-based uh, uh, effect, uh, you are going uh, to get this latency issue. So. A uh, really easy way of solving that is, uh, so see here, we've created 721 samples of latency. An LFO tool very conveniently has this offset here. So what you'll then do is just match that with the, uh, with the latency readout. So in this case, it is 721 
think there's a bit of latency somewhere else as well on the pass view key. So it'd be 75 latency. And there you go, we're back in sync again. So yeah, always good to be mindful of that when you're using LFO tool, especially on groups or if you're introducing other plugins in the chain that, that uh, cause latency. Okay, so uh, moving on. Um, yeah, so the next thing, uh, once I'd established the riff, um, was to um, get the drum track going. And um, yeah, and, and again, sort of in line with the concept of the track, I wanted the drums to be as simple and as uh, punchy as possible. Um, so just to expand a little bit on the drums. So very simple, just a kick, a snare and a hi-hat. Um, and yeah, just to kind of delve a little bit deeper into what I've got going on here. Um, I'm going to talk a little bit as well about sort of how, you know, my approach to sort of synthesising drums as well and how I kind of get my drum sound. Um, but yeah, if we listen to, to each hit in isolation, um, so this is the main kick. And, you know, I, I, I like to have quite a synthetic sound to my drums, but also uh, with uh, like a live feel too. So they're not, they're not too synthetic, you know, they, they still feel that, you know, they could be coming from a live drum kit. But I like to have as much control over them as possible in order to, you know, create a kind of as, as clean and, and clubby sound as possible. Um, so, yeah, so that's, that's my kick drum, and I'll go back into a bit more detail about that in a sec. Um, my snare drum here. So that's the first layer, and that's, that's essentially a, a snare which I, I probably took from another, another project, um, but, you know, what ends up happening a lot of the time is, you know, these kind of rendered snares will be mixed with other snares from other projects and, and enveloped and you know various different processes will happen to them along the way to create their results so it's often not um, a, a kind of linear approach to making uh, to, to making snare drums or kicks for that matter um, that's then layered with this kind of 80s layer here to give it that kind of like wide sort of roomy kind of Phil Collins sound uh, it's quite kind of typical of my production style to to use that that kind of aesthetic with my drums um, and yeah just a, a little bit of processing uh, went on here so using the DS10 drum shaper um, I just eased off a bit of the tail because I was actually going to add more tail to it with the other layer so it's important to get that down a bit um, and then again I used LFO tool here um, just to just to shave off a bit more of the tail more accurately. Um, you know, again, DS10 drum shaper down here is introducing 416 samples. So I made sure I inputted that into LFO tool in order to keep everything in sync. Um, then on the, the 80s layer, um, I, yeah, because all, all the attack is coming from the other layer. So I wanted to carve out a bit of room for that, you know, and also to avoid any, any phasing issues. Um, Rolled off a bit of the tops, and again, DS10 drum shaper, bring that, that's, that bring the uh, sustain a little bit down, and then combined, you know, they kind of sound quite, quite weighty together. Um, so yeah, I mean, I mean, it is. Uh, I've, I've wanted to kind of go into detail about making my drums for a while now, and uh, I figured this would be a good opportunity to do that. Um, I've got a bit of a here's one I made earlier. Uh, example of, of how I would typically make a snare drum. So um, for this, um, I'm actually only using Operator uh, to do it. So, but this can be done in any synth, whether it's Serum or whatever it is, is your sort of most comfortable um, sort of plugin to work in. Um, and yeah, I, I guess with, with drum hits, you know, I, I, I think of them as three main components so you've got your transient which is when the stick hits the snare drum the initial attack of the sound um, your fundamental which is like the the note of the drum the the kind of the the resonant boom or the, the sound it makes uh, that resonates with the drum um, to kind of create the, the tone of the snare and then you've got the tail which is essentially the the ringing out of of the snare drum and, and the kind of fizz um, and then, you know, obviously you, you, I, I like to add other layers too to kind of fill out the mids a little bit more and give it character. So, 
Um, so yeah, just to go into into how I would typically create those sounds. So here is the uh, the transient. So obviously it doesn't sound too much by itself, but um, if I kind of reverse engineer how I went about making that sound, so so here on operator you've got your uh, your oscillators, and um, before you start working uh, on a sound like this, uh, it's quite crucial to put the synth in in sort of series mode here. Otherwise, what will happen because it's an FM synthesizer? you'd essentially be layering waves on top of each other to kind of frequency modulate each other and that won't create the desired uh, uh, sound that you, you'll need to make drums. Um, unless you're going a bit abstract, of course. Uh, but in this case, we're, we're just creating uh, a transient. So if you listen to this one here, we've got essentially, uh, I've just pulled up a sine wave here. Um, I've cranked the decay right the way down to 113, giving it a quite a short release. Um, and then essentially the, the kind of the, the, the bite of the transient is coming from the pitch envelope here. So you can assign the pitch envelope to whichever uh, destination or oscillator you want. So in this case, it's assigned to A. And then we've just got like a very, very, very quick, sharp attack on this. Uh, sorry, decay. Um, the peak is where the note starts. So here it's starting at 48. And uh, yeah, so essentially it's starting from 48 semitones up and then it's arriving here at the, at the sort of the, the frequency, which is at uh, 285 hertz. Um, so there, so there you have it. That's our, our, the first part of our transient. Um, and if you know, you can kind of see on the uh, frequency analyzer that you know, it's mostly Sort of hitting around, you know, two to three k as, as the main sort of bite of it. You don't want too many tops, but then you, you will want to fill out the tops just a little bit. So then, what I do is I'll layer that with a uh, bit of white noise. And the good thing about operator is you can actually um, choose noise loops as opposed to noise white. And what noise loop does is it essentially, you know, it's it's creating. It's generating white noise based on a particular sample, and it's it's starting at the same point every single time. So, um, if I play that by itself, it's a tiny bit of white noise there. Obviously, you can change the phase here to kind of start at a different point. But when I load those two together, we then got our transient. And again, like this is a very you know the envelope I put on this is similar to to what I did with the sine wave, except I crank the attack up a bit because I wanted. The, there to be, you know, the sine wave to, to occupy more of the attack. Um, so yeah, once I've got the transient done, I'll then go to the fundamental. So, uh, you know, very similarly, I um, created uh, just a sine wave here. And then, you know, we've got our decay down uh, to about 95. Um, and, you know, really, you, you want this to be uh, a fairly, you know, uh, obviously it needs to be longer than the transient. Um, uh, but, you know, with a bit of sort of um, trial and error, you know, you can get it to, to the right sort of length that you want it to be. Um, and, you know, in this case, uh, again, just very simple, just a bit, of a bit of a pitch envelope on the attack of the sound. And that's only coming from 12, oct uh, sorry, 12 semitones up. Um, and again, I, I, I didn't use fixed mode this time. Um, obviously, you can use fixed mode uh, to sort of determine the exact frequency you want the snare to hit at. So, in this, you know, for example, here, uh, the the tune is in the key of F, and therefore I probably try and tune the drums to F. Uh, one seven four one seven five hertz is around about F. Um, so, you know, probably a good good place to start. You know, obviously, if you want to pitch the snare slightly higher, you know, you can crank this up. But yeah, so in this case, snare tune to F, and there, if you look at the MIDI, it's sitting at F. Um, and yeah, and what I did here was just put a, put a little bit of a gap between the transient and the, the fundamental, so these two guys aren't, aren't kind of overla overlapping and phasing. And that's something you need to be really careful about when, when you create these individual layers, is that they, they're not sort of 
you know, you're not getting any phase cancellation through either layering them together or, or putting them in sequence. And um, yeah, just moving on into the tail now, uh, which is a little bit more of a complex sound um, due to quite a lot of the processing I did afterwards. But if I switch that off, um, we can have a look at that in a bit more detail. So yeah, we started off with, again, uh, noise looped. Um, you can actually go for noise white with this one, but you just gotta be aware that each time it plays, it will sound a bit different. Um, so I'll keep it on that for now. Um, obviously we've got the frequency up quite high. But as I turn it up, it's going to be a bit brighter. So yeah, we're starting off with very basic white noise. Um, again here we've got the, uh, the, uh, the, the envelope of the sound with a slightly longer attack in order to let the transient and fundamental come through. Um, with, a, with a longer decay and a longer release, because you know, if you think about a snare, you've got that, that kind of ringing out of the snare in the tops. Kind of put these together. Kind of very basic, kind of synthetic sounding snare. Doesn't sound like much at the moment, but um, we can go into just a few of the steps along the way to help it along. And um, yeah, so what I did here, I literally just gave it a bit more presence there, around 5K. I think it's quite crucial to have that, that sort of presence up there. You don't want it to be too, too high, like fizzy tops because um, that, yeah, that can sound quite unnatural and harsh and a lot of snares have their presence around sort of 3 to 5k, even going up to like 8k. So the little boost there helped. I've got an auto filter here which essentially just doing a very quick sweep, like a um, just kind of like add that character in a little bit. The time the resonance you can hear it a little bit more. But yeah, I wanted to kind of take away a little bit of that low as it's, as it's kind of, as the sound is progressing. Um, Obviously I've got a, a utility there just to bring the volume up a bit. Um, what, I, what I quite like to do with my tails is to just uh, put a lot of saturation on them and, and this can actually you know, help fill out the, the tail a bit more and, and kind of help glue it together and, and just create more of like a unified sound. So here, yeah, that's it's actually increasing the, 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 the release of the tail a little bit there. You got your reverb here. I mean, like normally, I probably wouldn't go for something like uh, just the stock Ableton reverb, although it is good. Um, I'll probably draw for something like the Valhalla uh, Vintage, which is actually my current favourite reverb. But that's that's going to give you a bit more of a realistic kind of room em emulation. Um, I'll just fire up a preset quickly here. Say, so, I don't know. And I like it because obviously it's got you know a 1980s setting, um, but yeah, that that's gonna you know really help bring your snare to life and give it put it inside a space essentially, make it sound more realistic, and not like it's come straight out of a synthesizer. Um, so yeah, again here, I'll just switch back to how I had before. I'm just like filling up a, a bit of the, the low mids here, taking away of a lot of that really really high stuff. I mean, essentially, when, you've, when you're working with white noise, it's going from zero hertz right the way to the top. So there's a lot of unwanted high stuff there. So yeah, you really don't want to take, take the top off there. Um, and then, yeah, just to finish that sound off, a uh, bit more control on the, on the dynamics. So I added a utility at the end of the chain. And then I've, I've essentially just drawn in this curve here. So if you kind of bring that out a bit more. And that's going to that's going to control the tail of your sound. You can get really like precise, sort of, um, you know, over the the dynamics of the sound simply by using you know utility. Um, moving on to the clap. I mean, obviously this is done in a in pretty much the same way, although it isn't actually a clap. It's just again a bit of white noise. And yeah, so that was created with um, just simple white noise. I then added a filter. And using the envelope of the filter, um, it's sweeping up through the sound uh, with quite a high resonance. If I take it off, for example, turn it on. Got a bandpass filter here, and that's kind of you know giving you that that sweep up around the frequency range, which is kind of like arriving at around 1.5k, which is pretty much where a clap should be. Um, you know, I, th I think a lot you know a lot of time a lot of the time these days, I like to have a lot of presence around 1.5k. Because you know, you're kind of giving your drums that presence, you're filling up the mids, and you know it it does add uh, a kind of perceived weight to them. Um, so again, here uh, what I did with the 
actually created an audio effect rack. So then this gives you um, ultimate control over you know, the dry and wet of a sound without needing to use uh, sends and returns. Um, so I often like to do it with when I'm processing drums like this um, because essentially what I've got here is I've, I've got a 100% wet reverb. Uh, I'm not entirely sure why that says dry. That should say wet. We'll just change that. There we go. Um, and yeah, so I can basically have the sound dry and then I can have full control over the wet there. And again, what I've done to you know, adjust the dynamics of that is just to do a simple volume curve on, on the chain. So I'm actually controlling the, 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 the level of the chain here. And then, yeah, just finish off, again, rolling off the tops. Um, and that, you know, that's, that's it pretty much. Uh, if we play all those layers together, I mean, it won't sound, you know, like, like a fully uh, polished or um, realized snare, like the one I've used in the track, but, you know, th this is really just to give you an idea of, of where it starts and, and how I, I come about these sounds. Um, so, yeah, to all together, that kind of sounds like that, which, you know, given that, there, is, there aren't any like live layers going on there at all that's coming 100% out of the synthesizer. It doesn't sound too bad. Um, and, you know, a few take, like main takeaways from this are, you know, uh, different tracks will, will essentially um, command different aesthetics of snares. Uh, they'll, uh, you know, different tunings. You know, for example, in this track, I needed a snare which was in F. Um, you might write a track in G and you'll have full control over what pitch the fundamental sits at. So yeah, you can really just get, go, go deep and, and really find your own sounds with, with your drums by synthesizing them from scratch. Not only that, you're also gonna get a much cleaner sound and you know, you're gonna be able to deliver um, sort of quite a lot of like sonic, um, accuracy when you're making it yourself um, and then yeah just like the, the final step of what I would do here is I, I would probably f well I would definitely freeze them um, and start working with them in audio because again what I referred to earlier about kind of you know um, phase cancellation when working with layers that's really crucial when you're working with drums so I'm looking at uh, let's have a look I don't know what a fundamental looks like that uh, that bounced the wrong one, so here we go. If I just bounce these as audio, okay. So right, we've now got these as audio, and this is uh, a crucial part of the process because, as I mentioned earlier, you need to be very aware of uh, phase cancellation when it comes to you know layering drums and and sort of synthesizing them. So you know, in in this case, you can see here that the transient is actually overlapping a bit with the fundamental. And if you look at the peaks and troughs of these, uh, of the waveform here, um, obviously we've got kind of full polarity here and we've got negative polarity here. So yeah, so those two will give you problems. So, you know, a very quick and easy way to overcome that, you can either just use volume envelopes like this and again, you're still getting a bit of overlap there. But if you're fairly happy with the, the levels of these, then you can actually just put them together, put a little crossfade there. And there you go, zero phase cancellation issues. There you go. It's kind of, yeah. A lot, again, a lot of it is trial and error, and you're know, kind of working on a macro level. So um, I, I, you know, try not to be kind of intimidated by going into this kind of level of detail. Because uh, once you've done it a few times, done a bit of practice, it can um, become quite easy and quite quick. So yeah, then you've got your, your tail. And then you clap there. So yeah, and then you've got those together. You can really just kind of go in and just tweak it, you know, tweak it to your taste and your style. You know, other times you might just want to completely throw out the rule book, and I quite often do this. Just you know, saturate the whole thing, distort the whole thing, bring out more harmonics in 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 the fundamental. You know, you can either do that with uh, something like overdrive. If I just isolate that for a second, we'll bring that down to one seven four with the fundamentals at. Bring the key down, take the tone away. 
Uh, right, so if I bring up a analyzer, I'll show you in a bit more detail about how we can add some harmonix into that. So as I'm cranking up, obviously it doesn't sound amazing at the moment, but yeah, so here we go. We've now introduced a few more harmonics into the snare drum, yeah, which can help fill it out a bit. And a real snare drum will have harmonics like that too. So, um, and yeah, you might also want to consider, you know, layering with some live snares as well, um, which is pretty much what I do quite often. Um, Addictive Drums is great for this, just for sourcing very clean, well-recorded drum hits. Um, we'll just find the snare here. Let's bring the velocity up. There you go, we'll just use that for the time being. Um, and then in here, we'll choose our snare. Just take everything off it, because essentially we're just finding a good snare drum here. Take all the effects off, meet the overheads, the room and the bus. And there we go, nice clean snare there. Um, you know, you might want to mess around with the snare buzz a bit. I mean, in this case, we're just, yeah, we're just looking at, at the sort of harmonics and kind of adding a little bit more realism into the snare around the transient and the uh, fundamental, not so much the tail, I don't think, for a snare drum like this. So yeah, once I'm, I'm happy with that, um, I'll then, Resample it. And now I've got it as audio. And then you, then you can line it up with your, your transient and your fundamental. And just check out the phase, see how these, these are interacting with each other. Um, obviously at the moment it's actually a different pitch, I believe. Yeah, so it's a, we need to go a bit lower actually. So if I take that down, a good way of finding matching the pitch of, of layering drums is simply just to, you know, drag drag the D tune up and down and see, you know, do it until the waveforms line up, and then you can see that like when they're perfectly in phase. So now these two should, yeah. So now they they are layered nicely. Um, you'll know when they're not layered nicely because if I invert the phase here with utility, you can hear the fundamental just disappear. If I put it back on, sorry, if I take it off, there you go, we get a fundamental back. So yeah, those two are layered, now layered quite nicely. I'd probably, you know, do something, I'd probably take the, the top end off. Another thing to, to be aware of as well, like when using like Ableton stock EQ, um, I'd probably go for something a bit more precise with this, like, um, I'd probably go for like Pro-Q. Pro-Q 3 is pretty, pretty good these days. Um, you know, you, you could you could put it into natural phase mode just to remove any sort of phase issues going on, which will again introduce a bit more latency into your project. So if you're if you're mixing or tracking, I probably wouldn't advise doing this. This would need to be a process that that would happen in, in a separate project. Um, so yeah, here we can just bring out some of those harmonics. And that's really going to help it sound a bit more organic. Go for a more extreme curve. Yeah, so yeah, a lot of trial and error. But these are the fundamentals of, of how, you, how you get there. And if we then play all those together, not too bad. Take your tail off that maybe. And that one. Yeah, so that, that wouldn't, you know, that's not a bad place to start for a, for a D&B snare. Um, again, here I'd, you know, so there wasn't any kind of conflict between the transient and the live layer I just introduced, I'd probably just put a little fade there. Take off some of the tail there. And remove it. So it just, it, just sound, it just sounds a little bit empty, a bit flat, it doesn't sound very real. And then with it, kind of sounds a bit more like a snare. Um, so yeah, that's pretty much, um, you know, how I go about making my snare drums. Uh, you know, obviously, like I said earlier, a lot of the snares I'll use in final tracks will be sort of Frankensteins of other snares that I've made across different projects and layered them together and, you know, kind of found, um, you know, new snares out of that process. Um, but yeah, essentially that's, that's how I start. 
Um, and then, you know, going into the kick as well. It's, it's, a, it's a much simpler sound, I, I think, uh, but it's done in very much the same process. You know, you start off with your transient. But, you know, your, your kick drum transients are, you know, usually they're, they're sort of like biased around the kind of 2K, 3K range to get that kind of click. Um, fundamental again, I mean, this is actually, a, I'll, I'll use a different plugin for this often, uh, Kick T. This, this is still really good for, for making snares, actually. So you definitely bear that in mind um, when, when trying this out yourself. But um, with the kick drum here, again, it's kind of a here's one I made earlier, but um, I've used uh, this curve here to essentially control the pitch envelope of the kick drum. Um, and it, you know, it basically is just a sine wave, um, which you can you choose here. And then, you know, you kind of want to tell it what length you want the, the kick to be. So, you know, I've chosen here around, if I go for like, yeah, even sort of one, four, four milliseconds is quite a good length for a kick. So you, you don't want them to be too long so that, you know, you're filling out your low end too much and not giving enough room for your sub to really uh, come through, especially if you're working with like long sustain notes in your sub. Um, but yeah, so one, one, four, two is quite a nice little area you can go for. Um, you know, you're starting off the, the attack of the sound here. I've started about one, uh, sorry, nine, eight, eight. And then we're arriving down here at D1. But actually, you know, I'll often land, if I've written a tune in F, I'll land at low F, F1, at around 44 hertz. Especially in this track, I think I did that because, you know, my sub is on that low F. And if your kick is arriving at that low F, then you're going to avoid a lot of phase cancellation with your kick and your sub, and the overall effect should be a bit more harmonious. Um, so yeah, there you go. That's that's how I, I build the fundamentals of my kick in Kick T. And um, yeah, so now we've got our fundamentals sorted. Uh, moving on to the tail. So this um, is done in very much the same way as a snare tail, but because it's a much shorter sound, you know, you're, I've I've used. Um, a kind of shorter decay on the white noise here in operator, giving it some room on the reverb. Oh, hang on. And then taking away a bit of a low-end content. Um, again, I've added uh, another uh, part to the tail there because I, I, I felt like it sounded a bit too artificial. So I've got layer here, which is, that's just like a live layer taken out of addictive drums. And again, another live layer here too. You know, so that's giving you a bit more mids in the kick as well, and I think that's quite crucial, you know, to help it sound like a real kick drum. If you put them all together, there you go. You've got a, got a half decent kick there. Um, yeah, again, like main takeaways of building your own kicks like this: you can tune them to the key of your track, you can control the pitch envelope and the dynamics of how you want them to sound. Um, and I think really like. Uh, more importantly for me is like you know when you when you've got full control over the fundamentals of both the kick and the snare you know you're just removing any phase issues so you know your tracks are really going to connect in the club on a, on a big system and have that weight because you're able to let the, the waveforms have full amplitude um, on, on either polarity without any phase issues and um, you know you're kind of delivering maximum kind of sonic accuracy so yeah that is uh, the kick and the snare, more or less discussed. Um, yeah, so obviously that's not the kick and snare I made in, uh, for this track, but uh, used a very similar process to get there. Um, so yeah, now just kind of going back into the main kick. I, uh, sorry, the main kit I used on Hackers. Just meet some of these layers. Um, so yeah, uh, in addition to the kick and snare, um, all there really is going on is a hat, which I'm pretty sure I took from another project. I think it was my collaboration with, um, with TC. Uh, but this, this is just a, a simple live hi-hat. It's very straight. Got a, bit of, got a bit of a fade in there, so we let our kick drum cut through. You know, that's what's going to give you that kind of weight as well of your drums when you're you're sort of ducking the kind of higher frequency elements against uh, you know your kick and your snares. So exaggerate that. 
can really get in that punch there. Less so when it's like that, but yeah, with this track, I kind of wanted there to be um, a bit of hi-hat present like, on that drop, so you know, kind of it really feels like there's a, a strong kind of straight hi-hat groove running through it. So yeah, so that's that's kind of how the track started. I mean, I, I started with the the riff and then went straight into the drums and just got those two kind of working well together. Um, so if I play them together, you'll hear. Oh, that's not the right one. We'll go for this one. There we go. So literally with the riff and three drum parts, we've got pretty much the entire song, well not the entire song but at least the drop and, and that that is what I was aiming for with this track just to you know centre it all around very very simple minimal parts. You also notice as well like there's no sort of crashes or cymbals or anything like that going on on the drop. Um, you know this obviously has the benefit of not taking up extra headroom but um, you know, I think in, the, in this track, like it, it worked. You know, I, I didn't need to add loads of crashes and cymbals. Um, so I think you know, more or less, we're we're filling up the whole frequency spectrum. If I just pull up span again, we can see just from these few elements, and the curves looking pretty nice. Um, so yeah, uh, moving on to uh, other areas of the track. Um, I mean, I should probably just just you know go through what else I added to to the drums as it progressed so you know I mean this this, this track is kind of like a drum and bass track arranged like a techno track uh, in the sense that you know I'm bringing in other percussive elements as it progresses um, and in this case I've got here just really simple shaker we, and that you know that's that's kind of on, on the on the offbeat so that kind of really helps to groove along uh, it kind of increases the pace so when you hear it just as a straight beat and then when it comes in you kind of have that more you know eighth note feel to it and um, yeah so the, I mean this is a shaker that, that that's kind of just a stock uh, shaker that, that I've got in my library um, which I use in quite a lot of tracks and I, I wanted to make sure that it um, you know, it wasn't clashing with uh, the kick and snare. So anything I'm kind of adding into the, dr the drum track, I'm going to, going to want to duck against the kick and the snare, and this applies to cymbals, hi hats, or, or whatever. Um, so here, LFO, LFO tool was doing the work for me. It's literally just in this case, just ducking on on that second kick drum there. Okay, so that's the end of part one. If you want to see the rest of this video, then buy the latest edition of Computer Music.